interesting thing happened this past week and doesn't happen to me a lot, but it did this time. Some people say that God only speaks through this way or God only speaks this way or God doesn't do this anymore or God only does this. And I'm sure God gets a big laugh out of people telling God what He can and can't do today. God doesn't do that today. Well, God does whatever He wants to today, whenever He wants to, and here's why. Because He wants to. You know why? Because He's God and I'm not. And so because He's God and I'm not, I'll just let Him do, do and be whatever He wants to. Can we take a vote and let God be God? <laughs> it's big of us to do that, isn't it? I'm sure God appreciates that. You know, the church has been trying to be God for a long time, but, but God is God and we're not. Having said that, I was having a dream this week. I said, can God still speak in dreams? God can speak however He wants to. But you say, well, what if it wasn't real? This one was real, I'm going to tell you. Because this was the dream. Over and over and over in my mind, I kept hearing this. This is what I, and when I woke up, I was still hearing it. It was saying, this voice was saying, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. And you say, what in the world kind of dream is that? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Well, it's not my job to worry about why God says stuff. We've already said that. So when I woke up and I was thinking that it was in my mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, what would you have done if you'd been me? <coughs> you'd have got your Bible and looked, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's what I did too. I got up my Bible and then I was, Steve McVeigh called me that morning and, and I said, Steve, I had the weirdest dream. And the dream was this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 through 5, and it wouldn't go away. And when I woke up, I was still hearing it. And so then Steve asked me this. He says, what does it say? He was interested too. And I said, I'm not sure. I read it, but I think it says more than what I got the first time. And so this week I've been kind of going through that, letting it, what I call letting it stew. And then I finally took some paper and started writing stuff down that he gave me. Before I go on, I just want to share a few things with you, some introduction, if you will, as we look at the ministry of the new covenant. That's the whole thing of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to look at 1 through 11. I think we need to look at what comes before those verses and what comes after those verses. And we're going to see the ministry of the new covenant. <clears throat> but one of the greatest things we get with the new covenant is confidence. Confidence. Do you know you can be confident in the Lord? Not based on what you do, but based on what He does. Sometimes you've heard it said that an athlete or a musician or somebody else he said he's got all kinds of ability, but what he lacks is, what's the next word? Confidence. Judy, you've trained a lot of people to be stylists probably over the years, I bet. You know, trained to cut hair and, and do different things, and you've worked with them. And there may be some people, and I've seen this, that have a lot of physical, natural ability, but they panic or they just choke when, there's, when they're cutting somebody's hair. And I don't want somebody cutting the hair that does that. I've had plenty of them that did that with me, I want to tell you. But just like anything else, we need to have confidence. Do you know, to walk in who you are in Christ, you need confidence. But the confidence is not in you. The confidence is in Jesus. Confidence is a good thing. It allows one to, to live out of what he has been trained or gifted to do. God has trained you and gifted you to walk in who you are. In Him. The believer in Christ knows what's been given to Him. Sometimes. Sometimes He doesn't. That's what we want to do. We want to tell people what all that Jesus has given to them. The believer knows these things or he needs to. Now, I want to ask a question. What is it that has been given to men? What is it that's been given to men? It's really a simple answer. All that belongs to Christ has been given to men. Everything. Okay? Now this is what freaks me out. On the cross is where this was given. But it didn't just stop with some men. It has been given to all men. Now, are all men walking in what they've been given? No. The non-believer will never live out of this, what Christ has given him, because he has never received it as his own, and he's never believed that Christ has given him his own life. He's never been born again. He's never believed that Christ has forgiven him. Somebody that I respect very much, that I really, really like. Not only do I respect him, I like him. And I'm not going to say his name. He's a great guy. A strong grace guy. A wonderful man of God. Somebody that I respect immensely made the statement 
that everybody wasn't forgiven on the cross, if they did, everybody would be saved. That's not the case. That's not true. And I'm going to, I'm going to write him and I'm going to say, that's not exactly right, brother. Because you see, everybody was forgiven, but everybody hasn't been born again. Every, what's left to do? Do you realize that if everybody were not forgiven on the cross, Jesus would have to go back and do it again? There's nothing left to do. There's nothing left that He can do. The believer is born again because he has believed. Because he has believed and received what Jesus has done. He's not born again because Jesus did it that day. It's already finished. The true believer has received and believed all that was given him as his own. And he has confidence in it. He's confident in this fact. He's trusting in the shed blood of Christ and nothing else for his right standing with God the Father, Christ the Son. It was through the cross. The same things have been given to both the believer, now listen, and the unbeliever. There's nothing left to give the unbeliever. It's already been done. One has received and believed Christ and is born again and begins to walk in who he is in Christ. One did not believe and receive what Christ has given him on the cross and he's not been born again. John 1.12, it says, But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That's a critical thing, receiving and believing. But Christ has already done all that he's going to ever do. There's nothing left. Okay. The believer begins to walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh. Do you realize that the, the believer cannot walk in the flesh anymore? People have made the statement, he's in the flesh. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's walking according to the flesh. Big difference. You see, the non-believer can only walk in the flesh because that's all he has is flesh. The non-believer can only walk in who he is, flesh. But the believer, he walks in Christ. Now, can the believer walk according to the flesh? The answer to that is absolutely he can. He can look just like the non-believer, but that's not who he is. That's not who he is. He can still walk according to the flesh, but that's not who he is anymore. Now, the unbeliever can only walk in the flesh because that's who he is. There's nothing in the flesh that you can do to please God. There's nothing in the flesh that you can do to please God. Let me say that again. There is nothing in the flesh that you can do to please God. Stop trying to please God. Why? Here's why. Because God is pleased with you. God does not base His feeling toward you on what you do. He loves you. When did Rod, when did Robbie, when did God start to love you? Before I was born. Ah, before, wait a minute. He loved you before you got here? Mm -hmm. The Bible said, ah, it's even worse than what you said. The Bible says that God loved you before and chose you before the foundation of the world. First, I mean, that's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Oh, what a big deal. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. All that stuff was just thrown in, just free. Pretty good, though. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of condemnation commendation, excuse me, to you, to you or from you. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. I like the way it says that. You are a letter of Christ. Earl, you are a letter of Christ. People read you. They see you and they think, man, I want to have the same thing he does. I want to know the same person he knows. That's a pretty big deal. What is it they see about you that's different than other folks? Not only do you like people, you love people. Do you know you can love people you don't even like? In fact, a lot of times it's very hard to like people, but you love them. Okay. You are the letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Verse 4. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. We have confidence toward God. We can be confident in the presence of God the Father. Why? Because of Christ. Verse 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, 
but our adequacy is from God. Now, aren't those three pretty good verses, three, four, and five? Our confidence toward God is in Christ. Our adequacy toward God is in Christ. Verse 6, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Notice what it says. We are servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation, look at that, that's what the ministry of the, of the letter is, that's what the ministry of the law is. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Verse 10, For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Let's just look at it. In verse 1 through 3, we're going to see the condemnation. We're only going to see three things today. The condemnation, I'm sorry, the commendation of the ministry of a changed life. Or the commendation of the ministry of changed lives. You could even say it this way. The commendation of the ministry of those with an exchanged life. God didn't just change you. He exchanged what was His, gave it to you, and took what was yours on Himself unreal. In verse 1, there is no letter of commendation needed. Paul said, I don't need to prove anything to you. I don't need a letter of commendation. Paul didn't need this. Why? And he could say this, because you are my letter of commendation. He did not need to commend himself. They were not representing themselves as anything special. They were led to where they were by the power of the Holy Spirit leading them. They said, what the Holy Spirit said to them. Do you know what you're to tell people? It's really simple. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this in Pakistan? What we're to tell people is whatever God tells us. He's not saying, now, I'm going to tell you this so you can tell somebody else. That's not how He does it. You just tell people the same stuff that God's been telling you. And you know what? They'll go, wow! Because they'll look at you and they'll think, man, this stuff's real. This stuff's real. They were not trying to build themselves up or to impress anyone. Paul, Silas, they weren't concerned about showing anybody they were big shots. They didn't care. If you go into a building or to a service, I see this sometimes in churches around the world, and, and the preachers are all sitting sometimes in the important section, and everybody else is just kind of out there. You've been with me. You've seen it. And everybody else is just out there. All the peons are just out there. And when I go someplace, I sit with the peons. You know why? Because I'm nothing special in Craig. But we're all something special in Christ. Well, Paul said to him, you are our letter. What a great thing to be able to say, you are our letter. I can say the same thing to you. You people are so different. I was talking to somebody the other day. She, she works at a gym that I've started working out again since my surgery. Praise the Lord. And we were talking, and there's a guy there that had come here several times, and his wife's from Mexico, and he's got two beautiful daughters. And I was talking to him, and he said, Are you still meeting out there? I said, We are. And this lady said, Do you live in Forest Estates? I said, Yeah, I do. And she said, I used to live across the street from you. I said, Really? And she was a daughter. Of, she didn't stay there long, but she was a daughter of somebody. And the testimony of the cars in the yard was something that drew her attention. She wouldn't know that. It's amazing. Your life is a letter. Your lives can be read by others. You can't deny, you cannot deny a life with the exchanged power of the Holy Spirit. There is no denying it. Melvin, when Mike wanted to get saved, he watched you. Now, that's kind of a scary thought, but, but he did. And one day, I was praying, Lord, send somebody new. And I showed up over where we were meeting at that time, and there was somebody pacing the parking lot. And this guy I'm talking about is out preaching at a, at a jail or a prison right now. He's out there doing a prison service. And this guy was scared to death. But he didn't know much, but he just knew that whatever Melvin had, or I should say it, whoever had Melvin, 
He wanted some of it. And Mike trusted Christ. And since that time, many people have trusted Christ as a result of the letter that's been written on Mike's life. And it's the same with you. And you may not even know it. But you don't have to know it. It doesn't matter. It's not your job to know it. Just believe it. Just have confidence that Christ knows and Christ is in control. You can't deny a life that's, that's lived out of the power of the Holy Spirit. At one time, I would have said, you can't deny a changed life. I spoke about that a minute ago, but I don't say that anymore. I say now, you can't deny an exchanged life. It's far bigger than a changed life. Well, in Christ, your life is read by all men. You say, oh no, that's a big pressure on me. Here's the good news. It's not any pressure at all. You don't have to do anything. Just be who you are. And you say, oh no, wait a minute. You don't know how I really am. No, 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 no. You don't know how you really are. You see, sometimes you think that you are how you are when you're walking according to the flesh. That is not you. Who you really are is righteous and holy and set apart and loved by God. That's who you really are. And as you walk according to who you really are, I don't care what you do. You say, well, you don't care what we do. You say, well, you just think people do anything they want to. I do. That's exactly what I think. Do anything they want to. Well, let me ask you, what is it down deep in inside of you that you really want to do. Drink, carouse, you know, lay out, get drunk, rob banks, beat up women. I won't say that here because there are not many men that could. I don't think there's anybody in the room that could. But, but that's not the desire of your heart. Can we do those things? We could. But I'll guarantee you that'll make you miserable. It'll make you sick. You can't wait to get rid of it because you are an exchange being. You have a new life. Do anything you want to in Christ. Well, Paul had reproduced himself in the lives of these Corinthians. If you read 1 Corinthians, that was a wicked church. A wicked church. And you read the second book to the Corinthians, it was an amazing church. There were eight letters to the Corinthian church. Eight. We only have two of them. A lot transpired between the first one and the, and the second one that we have. God had totally transformed those people. Were they saved in the first book of Corinthians? They were. In fact, Paul called them saints, even though they were doing wicked things. Well, now they know who they are in Christ, and they walk according to who they are. Once you come to the realization of who you are, listen, no one can stop you. Once you come to the true realization of who you are in Christ, no one can stop you. There's nobody that can stop you in Pakistan. Not people that want to harm you because God is in control. God is big. Not people that want to water this thing down. People think you're watering down the gospel. They say that about what I say. And I say, no. No. I'm preaching the real gospel. You're preaching the potential gospel. What God could do, might do, if you do something. That's potential. I'm telling you the real gospel, what God has already done. Amen. We need a shout break right here. Amen. He's already done it. Well, it's the same thing that's true whether you're listening in this room or whether you're listening a long way off. It's finished. And it's finished because of Christ. Paul said that you are the manifested letter of Christ. That's you. That's you. That's you. I don't care where you are. If you're in Switzerland, people have been watching in Switzerland. Or if you're in Sweden... Even some people have gotten on here, I won't even say the country because they might get in trouble, in countries you wouldn't believe. I'm telling you, in Christ, you are the manifested letter of Christ. We're cared for by Him. And we're caring for each other. Paul said you were cared for by us. Paul was given the calling to be, under the, to be the under-shepherd for these Christians in Corinth. He's the under-shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd. We talked about that last week. But you represent Christ. You represent Christ. You say, that's a big burden. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's easy. It's light. Cared for. You care for people. He said, this letter is not written with ink, but with the Spirit. 
The letter's not written with ink. For years, I'm sorry, for years, we've tried to put it in ink. We have church covenants, and we put it on a wall. And I say, you don't need that. And they say, oh, yes, we do. And I say, no, you don't. Because, see, the covenant was made from God to God, and you benefit from it. You have nothing to do with the covenant. It's between God and God, and you're the beneficiary. He's decided. It has nothing to do with you. It's not a letter written in ink, but with the Spirit. It's not on stone tablets. And I'm afraid people are still going back to the stone tablets. It's not on stone tablets. That's not my words. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But in the human hearts, God has written His covenant in your heart. Why don't we have it written down? Why don't we have this covenant written down on stone tablets like we did the old tablets? Because the old stone... Why don't, we, why don't we have the new covenant written on the stone tablets? Because it was so much better. See, the new covenant is living. Where do you write down living things? In living people. He wrote this living covenant in a living heart. He's saying it was not the writings of the law that changed men. It wasn't and it is not. You do not study God by studying the law. You do not find out what the Father's like by looking at the law. Jesus said, if you want to know what the Father's like, what did He say? He said, look at me. He said, look at me. Philip asked Him. He said, if you'd show us the Father, it'd be enough. Jesus said, Philip, have you been with me so long and that you don't know that if you want to know the Father, look at me? He said, I'm like the Father. We don't study the Father by looking at the law. In fact, it's the Spirit of God. The law does not save. The law never has saved. It never will save. Jesus saves. The law reveals the need for Jesus. Is the law bad? No, the law is not bad. The law points people to Jesus, that they have no hope without Jesus. It said the law is lawful if it's used lawfully. And it's used for immoral, unlawful people. That's not you. That's not you. The law is not for you. The law was not intended to save. The law is not our God. Jesus. God the Father. God the Holy Spirit. Their God. They're our God. Men will see Christ in the hearts, the lives of of those who believe. He is loving people through His children. Do you know that Jesus is loving people through you? I used to say that we're the only hands that Jesus has on this earth. <laughs> and then I read, it's another time, then I read Acts 17, verse 24 and 25. It said He doesn't need human hands. He doesn't need anything you've got. Nothing. He doesn't need your talent. He doesn't need your ability. He doesn't even need your willingness. He can make you willing because He's God. He needs nothing you've got, but He's chosen to love people through you, and you get to be a part of it. Amazing. He's loving people through His children, and this will draw people to Himself through His love. You want people to be saved? You want people you love to be saved? You love them. Just love them. You say, well, I need to tell them about Jesus. You will. You will. Second point. We're going to see the new covenant of the ministry. The new covenant of the ministry. You say, the new covenant of the ministry, what's that? Well, in verse 4 through 7, we're going to see it. We have it through Christ, and it's toward God. Our confidence, talking about this confidence in God, it's what He has done for us. It's amazing. He was confident in heaven that He was going to do the right thing on the cross, and that the right thing on the cross, which was give us all that we needed, is going to be given back to Him. And so they're confident, and so because they are, I am. Have you ever not known something, but you knew somebody you trusted? And they said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. Have you ever been around anybody like that? And then Darwin, that's right. So don't worry about it. I got it. You know, before I went into surgery, and I was, I'm not going to tell you I wasn't scared. I was a little scared. This friend of mine, Ralph Harris, that I've never personally laid eyes on, Ralph is a dear brother, it was like 3 or 4 in the morning, and I was looking at my Facebook, getting ready to go to the hospital, and this thing popped up from Ralph Harris at that time of day. He said, I got you, brother. 
That's all he said. I got you. What was he talking about? He was saying, I'm praying for you. Don't worry about it. And you know what? That touched my heart. Well, in truth, that was God through Ralph Harris speaking to me, saying, I got you. What if we live like that? What if we live thinking that God's talking to us and saying, I got you. What if you would look at somebody that was really hurting? You don't have an answer. We don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for you physically, but I do have this answer. He's got you. But I want to tell you, I'm praying. I got you. Well, we can trust Him. We can have confidence. Not only has Christ and God the Father done what they have done for us, but God the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to believe it. If, if all this has been done for us, and it has, and we can't believe it, what good is it? I want to say this. You can't believe any of this stuff in your own power. You cannot believe one thing I'm telling you in your own power. God the Holy Spirit is the one who's given you the ability <laughs> to believe what He's done is true. Well, this is for the believers right here. This is for believers. Now listen. If you don't believe it and have confidence in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, you will never walk in the victory that's yours. If you don't believe what I'm telling you is true, it's true then you'll walk in defeat. Is defeat who you are? No. You're victorious. You're more than a conqueror, the Bible says. But you got to believe it. You say, well, I just can't. I just can't, Brother Craig. I just can't believe it. Here's what you do. You say, Lord, give me the ability to believe this. And He will. He will. You have confidence in the new covenant. The new covenant, here it is. This is what it is. God reconciling men to Himself apart from them through Christ by grace through faith has nothing to do with you. The new covenant has nothing to do with you. You're the beneficiary of the new covenant. The new covenant, now get this, is not actually new to God. We think the new covenant is really new. It's not new. It's from eternity past. We could even come up with a better name. I think we could call it God's covenant to man. It's not a new thing. There has always been a covenant of grace from God to man. Always. From before He created the world. It was there. It was first shown. Who was the first person to be the beneficiary that we saw physically of this new covenant of grace? Well, it was Adam and Eve in the garden. He showed His covenant of grace to them. Our adequacy in verse 5, I'm going to read verse 5. Really, really neat verse. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Our adequacy in Christ is from God. Can I make that any plainer? That's what the Bible said. Our adequacy only comes from God, and it's not anything that we can do. Give it up. You can't do anything to make yourself adequate before God. But here's the good news. Ready? You can't do anything to make yourself not adequate before God. So we're going to do some bragging. But who are we going to be bragging on? We're going to be bragging on God the Father, who was involved in this new covenant. God the Son, who was involved in this new covenant. And God the Holy Spirit, who was involved in this new covenant. This is a good thing because if it was anything that we did, it would be imperfect and it would not be enough. But since our adequacy is from God, it is perfect. Perfect. You are perfectly adequate before God. And here's the question. This is the question. For you, for you, for you, do you believe it? Do you believe that you are perfectly adequate before God? It has nothing to do with you. Nothing. It's all from Him and it's from eternity past. You are completely adequate in Him. It's yours. Well, in, in verse 6, it says, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. This is going to be big. We're going to see this. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
We, in our adequacy, are now servants. And another word for that is ministers. Servants of the new covenant. Servants, ministers. This means, this literal translation, one who executes the commands of another. Do you know the word that's used, the same word right here? It says, who also made us as servants or ministers, however, you, whatever your translation says, of the new covenant. You know what that word is? Deacon. Want to be a deacon? Good news, you are. I've gone through life as, as a Christian seeing people that want to aspire to be a deacon. Because they think it's a position that you hold, that you're elected to. Excuse me? You are elected to it, but it's by God. You are a minister of the new covenant. That's who you are. Minister of the new covenant. This is the word we have for deacon. What are ministers of the new covenant? Well, they're people that believe that God did it all for me because He wanted to and He's loved me from eternity past and I believe it's all Him, none of me and I want to tell everybody. That's a minister of the new covenant. That's a new ministry of the new covenant. That is a deacon. We are servants of the new covenant. We are ministers of grace. You say, I shouldn't have to say he's a grace person. Because there's some people that aren't. They're just not. They think that right standing with God after you're saved is based on what you do. You want God to be pleased with you, don't you? You ever heard that? Well, do this so He'll be pleased with you. i got another thing to say. If that's what you believe, here's, here's another thing I can say. you in a heap of trouble, boy. Because if it's based on what you do, you have no hope. Believe that? Amen. If it's based on what you do, you have no hope. But here's the good news. I trust in the hope. The hope. His name is Jesus. I was reading today in my devotional. If you want to have peace in life, if you want, if you want to know, oh, how would I put the word? If you want to relax in Jesus, hope in Him. Depression goes away as you hope in Jesus. Hope in Him. We're ministers of grace. Some may ask, I thought we were ministers of Christ. And I have the answer for that. Yes. To be a minister of grace is to be a minister of Christ. Same thing. Same thing. We're not ministers, second part of verse 6, we're not ministers of the letter, but of the Spirit. The Bible says the letter does what? What does it say the Bible says the letter does? Kills. Kills. Is that what you want to do? When you bang them with the law, boom, 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 you kill them. That's what it says. It's a ministry of death. But the, the other, the ministry of grace, it's a spirit, it's a, it's a life-giving thing. Folks, don't get caught up in mixing the old and the new. If I mix poison, a little bit of poison, a little bit of arsenic, or a little bit of some kind of other poison in water. I said, there's not much poison in there, just a little bit, have some water. Would you want that water? No, but that's what we're doing. That's what the church has been doing. It's mixed the letter of the law, ministry of death, with the ministry of grace, ministry of life. You can't mix them. They're not to be mixed. Spirit equals life. Well, what are you sharing or ministering with? The letter of the law? or the life of the Spirit. New Covenant equals life, equals Spirit, equals Jesus. Old Covenant <coughs> equals law, equals death. Those aren't my words. People say, well, I just found that harsh. Don't blame me. Blame it on Paul. He wrote it. There it is. Third point, last point. The glory of the New Covenant's ministry. The glory of the New Covenant's ministry. This is the conclusion, verse 7 through 10. I'll read it again, verse 7 through 11. But if, if the ministry of death in letters engra engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of commendation, that's the ministry of the law, 
For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. That's the new covenant, the ministry of righteousness. Verse 10, For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. Verse 11, For that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. The ministry of the life brings more glory than the law. Law equals ministry of condemnation. Again, that seems harsh. Those aren't my words. Those are his words. What do we share? If we want people to see Jesus in us, to know him personally, and to know his glory for themselves, we will talk and we will share about what Christ has done on our behalf. Our only part is to believe it, that it's finished. The new covenant of his grace has life that's been... Uh, uh, New covenant of His grace. It's His life given to men at the cross. All men. All men. My only thing is to tell people, believe it. Receive it. It's already been given. Only the new covenant. Only the new covenant. Christ gives His life to us and for us. And it's His glory. You know, it's so amazing. It says that, that if you want to see the glory of God, if you want to see the glory of God, share the glory of God. The glory of God is this covenant of grace, what God has done to men. All that other stuff will fade away. You've told me before, you go someplace and you hear old covenant preaching and it just, it just dries up your spirit. It just hurts. You can't stand it. That's because God has given truth to you. His covenant. There's only one. His covenant of grace. It's yours. Believe it. Receive it. You're going to see glory like you never dreamed.